let us continue in an attitude of prayer as we get ready to hear the gospel lesson. Will you pray with me, please? Oh God, open my heart and my mind so I can hear your word and know your will for my life. And then give me the courage to go from this place and live it. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, verse 15, or chapter 15, starting verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be uh, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Today our message is on the aspect of God's grace that is sanctifying grace. But let me give a quick recap if you've not been here or not been able to see the sermons um, on the YouTube channel. Two weeks ago we talked about God's grace being prevenient grace. It means that God's grace comes before us, before we even know that we need God's grace. And it works around us and within us. God's grace enables us our need for a Savior. And it really prepares us to receive the testimony of the Holy Spirit. I like God's prevenient grace. It makes me think of the good father that is working hard behind the scenes, even though the child doesn't understand, but the father's working on the child's behalf to prepare the way and to prepare the child to live into the life that that child has destined for. Last week, we talked about justifying grace. This is the part of God's grace that brings the forgiveness. At the moment of being justified, we are forgiven those sins. We are forgiven sins, and we are put into a right relationship with God. We're aligned properly with God. We are justified by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Price. For our sin. At that moment of justification, you begin the journey. You begin a journey of faith. And I think it's important that we understand this aspect about, um, turn on, about justification and sanctification, which we're going to talk about today. Justification and sanctification take place when we are born again. If you remember Jesus talking to Nicodemus in John 3, he makes the point to this religious leader that you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what? I can't climb back in the womb and be born again? What? That doesn't make any sense. But we know that that's not what Jesus was talking about. He's talking about being reborn truly in our hearts to understand and to accept and to believe the truth of who Jesus Christ is. 
At that moment of being born again, we are justified by our faith. Christ forgives us our sins at that moment. And the process of sanctification happens. Now you may say to yourself, what are we talking about with sanctification? Sanctifying grace. It is the process of purification. It is, it is a journey of holiness. To say that you are sanctified means that you are holy. So now theologically, some of you might be pondering around. So you mean at that moment where God justifies me, I am made holy. Well, yes. And no. See, sanctification is something that is an ongoing process. Now let me, let me bring this definition up to help you. Sanctification is the ongoing process, or we could say journey, to purification or holiness. The words correspond with what they are, because in a lot of ways, it is a process of purification. Sanctification happens throughout your entire life from that moment of being born again. The Holy Spirit comes within your heart and works to purify you, to make you holy, to make you good, to grow you, develop you. And as we'll come to find out, the term pruning applies here too. So it is a process. But at the same time, I believe that you can also talk about sanctification as a journey. A journey begins anew at that moment of being born again. And on that journey, your destination is holiness. And as you continue to abide in God and be with God, God's Holy Spirit continues to work in your heart to find those things that don't need to be there. Those elements of guilt or shame, the sinful desires that we have, those things of the flesh. It is the process of purifying that, of making us holy. That's what we're talking about with God's sanctifying grace. His grace working in us to grow us and move us on a path to holiness. I like what John Wesley said here about sanctifying grace. He said, it's the grace by which God makes us holy in heart and life. The grace by which God makes us holy in heart and life. So I want to go through our gospel lesson with just some different what I'm calling Lessons from the Vine, our journey with Jesus. And the first lesson is that Jesus is the true vine. It says it right there in verse 1. I am the true vine. Well, let's talk about just for a second this metaphor of the vine. We associate vine with growing grapes. Has anybody here ever grown grapes? What, all you farmers? No one ever grew grapes? Well, here's the thing about grapes. As far as I can tell from my research, it takes at least an average of three years before you can actually produce fruit that you can harvest. And I can remember there was a, a vineyard where we used to live, oddly enough, kind of down near the city, but this vineyard was put in there. And literally for three or four years, you're just watching these rows of what looked like just dead vines, right? But it's the process of it growing and growing. And it just takes time before the plant really produces fruit. This metaphor that Jesus is choosing to use would be something that would be very familiar to the disciples. They would understand what it is to, to be a, a plant and to be one of these vine plants. They would understand the metaphor of the vine dresser or the gardener um, and understand about the vine and the branches and what produces fruit. So what do we need to know about Jesus being the true vine? Well, that metaphor is to help us understand that Jesus is the source. You must be connected to the vine if you are going to grow and if you are going to produce fruit. He is the source. Jesus Christ is the word of God made present to us so that we would understand the source. We would know who God is. His teachings were good and pure, most importantly the power and authority that God has in Jesus Christ. 
what he gave Jesus to be that shining example and to be that sacrifice for us. We put our hope and our faith in the one who suffered death for our sins but rose again in conquest of death. Death can no more ever come to Jesus. He is the living God. So he is the true source and vine. And what else do we know about the vine? Well, the vine is what nourishes the branches. The vine provides the nutrients so that the branches can grow. And let's bring in the vine dresser. What does the vine dresser do? The vine dresser is the one that takes care of the growth and the maturity of the branch and the vine. Jesus, in the gospel lesson, talks specifically about how he is in the Father and the Father is in him. So that direct source of nourishment is coming from the living God himself to us. Now we know he's speaking specifically to the disciples. And he says the disciples are the branches. Does that mean that because of time, we are coming out of the branches ourselves? No. One of the early problems in the early church was people arguing, saying, well, I'm a disciple of Mark. And some people over here would say, well, I'm a disciple of Peter. Or I'm a disciple of John. And there became this disagreement of things. But you know what the apostles all said? No, 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 no. You are not a disciple of me. You are a disciple of Christ first and foremost. It is not me that you should be following. It is Christ. You see, in all of this, as he talks to the disciples about branches being connected to the vines, you are the branches. Your connection is to be in the vine. You have the opportunity of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal relationship, not through somebody else. No, you can have a personal relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you can draw your power from. Not from me, not from another theologian, not from a disciple. No, we can have that true connection. One of the words in the gospel reading today talked about pruning. I think pruning can sometimes be misunderstood. Pruning is not just simply lopping things off. I think Jesus makes very clear a couple things here. The vine dresser prunes. That means things that are living and good and producing fruit actually get pruned or purified. The actual Greek word, when they talk about the meaning of it, it is to cleanse or to purify. So you're taking a branch that is producing fruit. More fruit. It's one of the things I think for, for a lot of Christ followers that they're living the walk and they're doing the best they can and they're seeing good things from their actions. But then sometimes there's this change that has to occur. And we're like, well, what's wrong with the way I'm doing things? But sometimes that's God's action to say, yes, good things are happening, but even more can happen. That is the imagery of the vine dresser. The vine dresser, not only does it prune, it also forms the branches. In the early stages, the growth from the vine as the branches go, they actually move the branches. They line them up so they can grow and spread out and be able to produce fruit. I think it's an important image for us to understand. One of the things in the gospel readings of Jesus' account here is the word abide. The word abide, if we look at definitionally, it's not about just remaining in, but it's to accept or act in accordance with. So when Jesus says, abide in me, what he's saying is, accept what I'm telling you. Act in accordance with what I am showing you and telling you. It is that kind of connection. That's what it means to abide in him. See, being in Christ and Christ being in us helps to make us sensitive to God's will. Helps us to understand when he's moving us, where he's showing us things. And that allows us to blossom and flower. 
I got one other thing to say under this thing about being nourished. What are the ways in which we get nourished? What are the ways that we get plugged in? Well, if we're truly abiding in God, I think that there are some very specific things Scripture tells us. Number one, participating in worship and prayer. Coming before God and worshiping and being with Him. Not worship at Him, not talk about Him, but with Him. That's why He blessed us with the means of grace of a prayer. A good prayer life, constant communication, staying in touch with God is a way that we abide in Him. Serving others as Christ demonstrates. As He calls us to go out, to serve others, to take care of needs. Can we leave out sharing the gospel? Speaking the words that Christ has taught us to speak to other people. To share with them the good news and life that can be found in Christ. See, God calls us and we respond. God's sanctifying grace is working in us to develop these things. To stretch us. Prune us. Let me go to this next thing. Oh, I did. <laughs> hmm. The branches in the vine produce fruit. See, only when we are connected to Jesus, only when we're connected to the vine can we really produce fruit. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The sanctifying grace of God is at work, and it's really through the work of the Holy Spirit, forming us, shaping us. And I remind you again, even if you are bearing fruit, God will prune you so that you can produce more fruit. Everything that we do, the nourishment that we get from God, it is pure and it is holy. And as we stay connected, we have a chance to do really good things. Because God is the source of it. I think to remember the warning that Jesus gives us. Apart from the vine, the branches cannot bear fruit. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Here's a warning to the disciples about remaining in accordance with what Jesus is teaching them, telling them to do, being in that relationship. If the disciples were to leave that source of power, if they were to, to step away and try to go on their own, then all of their works would be for nothing. It would not bring glory to God. It would not show respect and glorify God. And it would not show that they were disciples of Jesus. Which, of course, then brings us at a very challenging point in our individual lives. This point of self-examination. Are the things that I am doing in accordance with what Christ expects me to do? That might be one of the most humbling and scariest things any person can do. Because how easy is it to live in the world and to follow into the rhythms of the world? But we are called to remain in Christ. To be his example. To bring glory to the Father. It is a reminder of our need for Jesus. To be connected with him in all things because our efforts by themselves will fall short. And when we talk about producing fruit, we're obviously not talking about grapes. And quite frankly, I'm not sure we're even talking about just doing good deeds. When we're talking about producing fruit, it means, I think, as much as anything, helping to make disciples. 
to be able to share God's message and allow God to lead us so that our witness to others might bring them to Christ. To be a person that can encourage others to seek that relationship. There's one thing I know. I can't pray anybody into heaven. And there's nothing I can do that's going to save anybody. Really, it, it's a humbling thing. You would like to be able to tell somebody, to reassure somebody that, hey, everything's going to be great. But the reality is, all I can do is point you to the one who can. It's really all I can do. Eloquent words or speeches don't mean anything. But for us to abide in Christ, to stay a part of it, that's where the power comes from. That's God's Holy Spirit moving through you with the words that need to be heard by the person you're talking to. It's the power of the Holy Spirit guiding our actions, tugging our hearts to move in a way to show God's grace to somebody else. To have a heart of forgiveness. And most importantly, to point people to Jesus. <clears throat> I think that the, the story of, uh, well, the metaphor that Jesus is talking about with the vine is such a great one. And there's a lot of different little elements we could certainly talk about. But what we do know for sure is that Jesus is the true vine. The vine nourishes the branches. It is through his power and his source that we are shaped and moved, sometimes uncomfortably, but always for the better purpose of making us holy. That when we are in the vine, we can produce fruit. When we are connected with Christ, we can produce fruit because he is working through us. And we also have to understand that apart from him, ultimately we can do nothing. But let me end as the gospel reading today ended. Abiding in the love of Jesus brings us the joy of Jesus. In verse 11, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Receiving a type of love that is unconditional, that is undeserved, but you are loved. Nothing you can do can gain any more love or any more favor. This kind of love is poured out for you so that you know that you are not alone, that you know that your mistakes are not what has to define you, that the sinful nature that you sometimes feel is not going to keep you prisoner, but that you can be freed from that. God loves us in such an amazing way. And through Jesus Christ, we see Jesus saving us. And God's amazing grace through the Holy Spirit helps to make us holy. Because look, at the end of the day, you are not made just to exist. You are made to be holy and perfect. Now, in this world... No one expects you to perform perfectly. But through God's Holy Spirit, he can perfect your intentions. He can work to purify your hearts and your mind. And so at the point of time, when you move from this world to the next, you will be made right and holy and perfect in the eyes of God. That's the quest. That's the goal. Not to simply exist, but to move towards perfection. I want to remind you something that Noel read to us in the scripture reading. No one is born of God. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. 
as I began the message today, telling you the point of being born again, you are justified, you are forgiven for those sins. And you are made right in the eyes of God. And the ongoing process of God's sanctifying grace is to work in you to make you perfect and holy in his eyes. Never to remain the same. Never to get to a point where you no longer need to grow. You are always, always moving towards holiness. That you can look and test your actions, your attitudes, your beliefs, your words against that of God's. Not telling you that you are going to be perfect in all things. But that sanctifying grace covers those unintentional sins, those sins that happen. God's grace works before, justifies you, and works all through your life. And that is good news that we can use. That is good news that should keep us going every single day. You do not have to go through this world alone. You do not have to hold on to any guilt or shames. God's grace will cover that. It is truly the greatest message of the gospel. That you are not a prisoner to the lusts of your heart. You're not a prisoner to the doubts and guilts in your mind. You can be set free be made perfect in Christ. That's the message you want to take to the rest of the world. And that's the message you need to take to your own heart. And it's the message that God asks you to keep sharing with everybody else. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we can do nothing more than humbly give you thanks for the grace that you pour out onto us. We humbly acknowledge that we do not deserve it. But Lord God, we are eager to receive it. Lord, allow your grace to work in our hearts to peel back our own understanding so that we can gain the wisdom that you wish to give us. To decide the guilt and shame, the things that we know bother us, that hold us back. And Lord, sometimes those things that we don't even realize are still keeping us prisoner. Lord God, today, let me open my heart to receive this grace that is going to work to perfect my heart. Let me receive it openly. Let me be a participant so that I can see the work that you're doing and I can step forward and embrace the joy that you wish to place there. were in the beginning and are now and will be forever, we give you thanks and praise and all glory to you as we joyfully receive your gift of grace. Amen. <laughs>